big place, America, with 48 states like part of a growing family. Same blood, but with different interests. Out of the different interests, the pastures and villages and farms, cities and towns, we came. National Guardsmen from North Dakota, South Dakota, Iowa, Minnesota to form the core of the 34th Infantry Division under the leadership of Major General Walsh. It was not the first time. When Abraham Lincoln called for volunteers in 1860, the first Minnesota Volunteers, forerunners of the 135th Infantry Regiment, contributed heavily to Northern strength during the Civil War. And again in 1918, men from these states volunteered to fight for America, formed the 34th Division, excelled on the field of battle. But the hard-won victory did not bring lasting peace. A power-hungry maniac named Hitler stirred a frenzied people to aggress them. Once again, men from the Midwestern states left their homes for the training camp. Long hours, long days, tired feet, aching back, turned peaceful civilians into hardened soldiers. Almost before we knew it, we were on our way. A trip to parts unknown. There was no turning back now. Then we were in Belfast, Irish band and all, the first American troops to reach foreign soil, Major General Hartle commanding. More training days lay ahead, even more rugged than in the States. We did so well that 80% of the crack first rangers were Red Bull men. Then training came to an end. We're on our way. We were in our starting blocks waiting for the gun to go off. Every man had his own way of passing time. We knew something big was underway. We found out what it was. Operation Torch, November 1942. That meant landing on three separate beaches. Casablanca, Oran, and Algiers. The 168th RCT had the job. They helped establish bases for a final assault on Tunis. We climbed down into the landing craft, shoved off for our first beach. We were covered by big guns. Felt good to see those heavy shells going out. Big guns are a help, but the actual fighting and mopping up was left to us. Time out for cheers and parades. A brief time out. There still was a lot of ground to cover. A long, rough road lay ahead. Many battles to be fought. A few to be lost, others to be won. We were moving up now to the key defense in the Battle of Tunis, the tankers running interference for us. But the Nazis rushed through Faid, pushed their way back to Kasserine Pass, with armored columns advancing in a three-pronged assault. We lost 2,500 of our buddies. Rummel, the old desert fox, was in the driver's seat at Kasserine. 
German air power rules the sky. Then, on the verge of defeat, we dug in with the French and British and drove them back. Then we moved forward again. But there still was some of the bloodiest fighting of the Tunisian campaign left. A pile of twisted rock known as Hill 609. The enemy had height, observation, fortified positions, and good fields of fire. It was rough, and we paid in blood for every inch of ground. But we won that battle too, the toughest in the Tunisian campaign, and on May 1st we held the summit of Hill 609. The 34th had come into its own as a cool, skilled fighting machine. We kept after the Germans, always moving up, pushing them back. inside their battered uniforms. The peace-loving American had become a superior soldier. Now he was receiving a conqueror's tribute. In no time, the party was over. We were on our way to the Italian front, Salerno, in support of the 36th Texas National Guard Division. That was a tough feat. The Germans held the hill and held Americans in their gun sights. Attack and counterattack. The beach had almost lost, regained. German aircraft was very heavy. Our artillery was a prime target. Only our Allied anti-aircraft kept them off, made them pay. We began landing in Italy on D plus 12 to drive on Avellino under command of Major General Ryder for a continued attack on Benevento. The 34th was fully committed to the long, arduous, bitter Italian campaign. First, the push across the Volturno River, three desperate crossings, battling the elements in addition to mines, rifles, machine guns, mortar, artillery. Names that will never be forgotten. Dragone, Ruviano, a half dozen other small towns, too hard to pronounce. The guy who said there was no glory in the infantry said it all. There wasn't time for glory. We were on the move again. Mud. Mules, mountain. And General Eisenhower, General Clark, and General Smith didn't sidestep the mud either. That meant new plans in the making. The 34th had fought its way to the German winter line. The 34th led the attempt to break the German winter line with the commanding general laying plans for an all-out assault. Mount Pantano was the key German anchor. Once this hill was taken, other key points could be approached. Mount Pantano was first attacked on the 29th of November by the 1st Battalion, 168th Infantry. By December 4, when the 135th Infantry relieved the 168th, 777 casualties comprised the human cost for a mile's advance. With Fontano out of the way, the 5th Army moved on. Mount Lungo, San Pietro, Mount Samuro fell. 
The 34th took San Vittore, Mount Lachiara, Tevaro, Mount Procchio. The winter line was completely smashed. This feat, accomplished in foul winter weather, against a series of mountain and trench positions, outstanding in the history of American arms. But there's always another hill. This time, Casino. If Casino falls, the march to Rome is assured. But Casino did not fall. The 34th battle for Casino lasted until the 14th of February with little change in position. Each day and night saw bitter engagements fought, desperate attempts by enemy and ally to gain or regain position. Our men did heroic deeds under terrific odds. Beset by winter weather, superior observation, mountain defenses. The 5th Army failed to take Casino. We were on the defensive. Finally, bombing of the monastery was ordered. It crumbled as we left the valley for a rest. <laughs> Meanwhile, the 6th Corps opened up the Anzio Beachhead, a flanking maneuver. On the 27th of March, the 34th relieved the 3rd Division on the Anzio Beachhead. D plus 64. Broken in replacements on the line dug in, waiting for the breakthrough. It came. 23rd of May at 2.15 a.m. Complete surprise has been achieved. The 135th Infantry was part of Task Force A under Major General Harmon. All the first day objectives were taken. On we went. The medics kept faith, saving lives, softening pain wherever possible. German resistance at La Nubio finally broke about the 1st of June and we were off on a mad dash to Rome. Some of us stayed long enough to get the cheers. For most, we moved across the city's flank and without halting, speeding up the west coast, capturing the great port of Civitavecchia, moved quickly northward to the Tarquinia area, there enjoying an all too short rest. Then, northward once more. Now, for the first time in Italy, we had a real rest, hot showers, Clean clothes. General Clark presented a presidential citation to the 100th Battalion, the famous Nisi outfit. You are always willing to close with the enemy. He has no bluff on you and you've always defeated him. And let me tell you again, the 34th Division is proud of you, the 5th Army is proud of you, America is proud of you. And I know that whatever future action you go into, you will conduct yourselves with glory and bring about the peace that we are entitled to. Good luck to you, and God bless you. But wars do not wait on honors. The enemy still held north of the Arno, 
They had dug in as they had dug in at the winter line north of Naples and at the Gusti line at Casino. Now the Gothic line barred the way through the Apennines. The Po Valley was as heavily and effectively guarded as was the Leary. Once again, winter weather, fatigue, casualties, supply joined the German defenses. The attack ground to a halt. A long winter holding action followed. Numerous attack plans were made, but execution was delayed due to the miserable weather and resulting road conditions. During the winter of 1944-45, General Truscott took command of the 5th Army. In the spring, the 34th was relieved for a short rest before sparking the next all-out assault. General Charles Bolte took this opportunity to decorate many officers and men for jobs well done. The 34th did well in the matter of decorations. 14 medals of honor out of 201 presented to all services went to heroic members of the Red Bull Division. Also numerous DSCs, Silver Stars. April came. So did the all-out assault on the last mountain line in Italy. The 168th led off. It took four bitter days to break the enemy entrenched on Mount Belmonte, the Sebizano Ridge, Gorgogano Church. On the night of April 17th, the 1st Battalion, guided by recently captured PWs, skirted the left flank of the 2nd Battalion, followed a stream through extensive minefields, captured hundreds of the enemy, and by morning had penetrated the full depth of the German position. During the night of April 20th, the 133rd mounted tank entered Bologna. The 34th was in the Po Valley. And then the 34th shifted into high gear, turned northwest, cut through the supply lines of an entire German army attacking north, took Modena, Reggio, Parma, Piacenza, held a thin 80-mile front across the retreat route of no less than three relatively intact enemy divisions. This was one of the boldest maneuvers in the entire campaign. Not satisfied with this masterly action, we doubled back, breaking contact with the enemy, moved 150 miles in slightly over 24 hours. A fitting conclusion to years of desperate effort came when the 34th German Division surrendered intact to the 34th American Division. Victory in Italy followed on May 2nd, while German troops and civilian supporters trooped into concentration areas in vehicle or on foot. Exhausted 34th men slept. For them, the war in Italy was over. Now, once more, 34 is the symbol of peace. Secured by a new Red Bull Division, National Guardsmen from Iowa and Nebraska. Mission to carry on a peacetime service to the people. October 1943, the Allied armies in Italy had attained their initial strategic objective. The British 8th Army now held the vital network of airfields at Foggia, while General Clark's American 5th Army captured Naples, a major seaport where supplies and troops could be landed. By keeping pressure on the enemy in Italy, the Allies hoped to keep German troops from the critical Russian front. The German 10th Army withdrew to the hills north of the Volturno and prepared for a determined stand. Our first obstacle, the Volturno, a river winding through mountain and valley to the sea. Fall and winter rains can change the Volturno from a peaceful stream to a raging torrent. Many of the bridges spanning the river had been smashed by our aerial bombing. 
Others were blown up by the retreating enemy to delay our advance while they improved their defenses. Three days' rain had caused the river to rise six feet. At some points, it had overflown its banks, swelling to a width of 200 to 300 feet. On 8th October, the 5th Army, made up of the 10th British Corps and 6th American Corps, was deployed along the southern bank of the river. The British 10th Corps front extended from the coast to Kapur. The American 6th Corps area extended 35 miles east from Kapur to the rocky slopes of the Matesa Range. The 46th Division was on the left, 7th Armored Division in the center, and the 56th Division on the right. The 6th Corps sector at this time was made up of the 3rd Division, the 34th, and the 45th, which would drive down the Kalori Valley toward the junction of the Volturno and Kalori River. Midnight, 12th October, the 6th Division struck simultaneously on a 40-mile front. The enemy gave ground. Early the next morning, engineers, wet and cold, still wearing summer issue, fought the rough Volturno. Engineers supporting the 34th Division lost equipment, had to change location twice because of enemy fire. The river was 70 feet wider at this location. Against all obstacles, the bridge was completed. Two days later, 15th October, over our newly constructed span of Truflisco Gap, British Bren gun carriers crossed the Volturno. The crossing of the Volturno was a battle of construction and supply. With equipment and supporting weapons moving steadily across our bridges, the battle had been won, and the 6th Corps was ready to pursue the retreating enemy. At Alvignano, occupied the morning of 17th October, Major General Ryder, commander of the 34th, ordered Colonel Butler, commanding the 168th Infantry, to drive on to Dragoni, two miles to the northwest. On our right flank, the 36th Artillery supported the 45th Division. This assault struck at the last line of hills barring the approach to the upper Volturno Valley. Casualties were high. In a single day, the 6th Corps lost 545 men. One regiment lost three battalion commanders in 12 days. In early October, American Japanese fighters of the 100th Infantry Battalion arrived at Alvignano. Composed entirely of second and third generation Americans, this outfit was alerted for immediate action in the 34th Division zone. All along the front, we killed and captured enemy rear guard forces who fought delaying action. By 18th October, the 3rd and 34th Divisions were converging on Draconi. Throughout the day, the 3rd Division shelled Dragoni. The next day, the town was occupied by the 168th without opposition. Some prisoners from the 3rd Panzer Grenadier and 26th Panzer Divisions were taken. They reported heavy casualties. From another Italian town reduced to rubble, another group of homeless refugees were evacuated to the rear. The 45th Division, attacking northeast from Fecchio, advanced to Piedmonte d'Alife, supporting a second crossing of the Volturno by the 34th. 45th Artillery barraged a small village while the 34th fired on the Alife piedmonte road. The infantry pushed over rough terrain. By 20th October, Piedmonte d'Alife and the nearby town of Alife were both occupied. Our forward troops were pressing the enemy close. But now, in order to keep men, vehicles, and supplies moving, a great battle of reconstruction began. A treadway bridge constructed with the aid of a mobile crane. Our advance depended on our engineers. They worked fast. It wasn't only demolitions which faced American engineers. There was continuous rain, culverts to be dug, entirely new roads constructed. The war in Italy has been frequently called the war of roads and bridges. Infantry and engineers fought as a team. Enemy demolitions were calculated to hold us up for more than 24 hours. But in a matter of a few hours, bridges and approaches were in operation again. Purifying drinking water, 
frequently polluted by the enemy was another task for our engineers. In one day, they could provide 20,000 gallons of drinkable water for use by frontline troops. Another service, showers for the 34th near the battlefront with hot water. This portable unit moved with the advance of the troops. The 45th Division, in action ever since it landed at Salerno, withdrew into Corps Reserve. The 34th and 3rd pushed northward, driving for the Capriatri of Alturno and for the opening in the mountains near Mignano, known as the Mignano Gap. Elements of the 34th, held back by the enemy for two days, entered Prata the 29th October. Inhabited dwellings were blown up without warning by the Germans in an attempt to block the road through Prata. A few broken bodies of helpless villagers could not hold back in advance. A third crossing of the winding Volciorno was just ahead. On our left flank, the 3rd Division on 27th October advanced over the heavily mined road to Pietro Villamo. Medics of the 3rd Division gave wounded German soldiers more consideration than they bargained for. Civilians also needed medical care. General Truscott's 3rd Division fighters had driven the enemy from several mountain heights. They were showing signs of exhaustion. To ease supply difficulties, an oil pipeline was built by three engineer companies. All types of fuel, with the exception of lubricating oil, were piped through. By storing gas in five-gallon containers, large, vulnerable gas depots were eliminated. In the Venafro area on 3rd November, the 6th Corps crossed the Volturno for the third time. The 3rd Division continued to press against Mignano. 504th Parachute Infantry on the right drove high into the mountains and guarded 5th Army's right flank. The 34th Division above Capriati crossed the river north of Venafro. The 45th Division moved up from Corps Reserve through Venafro and drove to push the Germans from the mountains beyond. Once more, our engineers faced the task of bridging the Volturno. Wind and rain continued. On 4th November, the Volturno, lashed by a wind of hurricane velocity, changed overnight into a raging torrent. Against all difficulties, bridges had to be replaced quickly to keep supplies moving. Wherever possible, light vehicles crossed over the riverbed. November rain came down unceasing. Bivouac areas became flooded fields of mud. Military operations came almost to a standstill. Roads were stretches of mire that became deeper as we pushed into the mountains. Streams flooded over their banks, washed away temporary bridges and bypasses. All along the front, vehicles bogged down in mud. It was a back-breaking job to drain the almost liquid mud from the road. The forward movement of men and supplies became slower and slower. In the mountains, water gushed across the surfaced roads and roadbeds were washed out. By mid-November, transportation was almost at a standstill. Precious time lost, which the Germans used skillfully to build a new strong line of defense. The German winter line in the mountains above Mignano and Venafro. An immediate offensive against this line was impossible. There was too much work to be done behind our line, on bridges made useless by the enemy and the weather, on roads which were constantly a serious problem. Rock quarries supplied tons of crushed stone needed to fill in mud-soaked roads. From the front to far behind the lines, preparation went on for the 5th Army offensive against the German winter line. In the mountains were miles of trails over which supplies could be carried only on the backs of mules. The average Italian mule could support 220 pounds. 250 mules were required to supply the basic needs of an infantry regiment in the line. There could have been no winter campaign without mules. On the flats, our trucks could churn through the mud. On the highest slopes, only men carrying light loads could make the ascent. Between these two extremes, the use of mules was an absolute necessity. After two weeks on 1st December, we were ready to attack the winter line. On the right, the 6th Corps with the 34th and 45th Divisions was in contact with the British 8th Army. On the left, the British 10th Corps was made up of the 46th and 56th Divisions poised to cross the Garigliano River. At this time, a new corps, the 2nd, was brought into the center of the line. 
and assigned command of the 36th and 3rd Division. Attached to this corps were the 1st Special Service Force, highly trained American and Canadian troops, the 1st Italian Motorized Group, and the American 1st Armored Division. This force was concentrated against the Mignano Gap, which we had to enter in order to break through to the Leary Valley, which led to Rome. The Mignano Gap is a narrow valley squeezed between mountain masses, Mount Camino to the south, and Mount Samucro to the north, on the side of which is built the town of San Pietro. Like a stopper in this bottleneck, Mount Lungo rises from the floor of this valley. Beyond Mount Lungo, there were further mountain barriers, including Mount Trocchio. Our offensive started with Operation Raincoat, code name for a thrust on the left of Mignano Gap at the Camino Hill. Late afternoon, 2nd December, 925 field pieces poured tons of shells into enemy positions. Backed by this strong artillery support, the 1st Special Service Force captured Mount La Defensa and Mount La Rematania. The 56th Division took Mount Camino. The 36th captured Mount Maggiore. By 10th December, Operation Raincoat was completed successfully. Troops of the 1st Italian Motorized Group moved into the Mignano area to join the 36th Division. This marked the first occasion of Italian soldiers fighting side by side with Americans. It was decided that Italian troops should strike to take Mount Lungo. A second Corps artillery barrage supported the effort. The Germans were too well entrenched on Mount Lungo. By noon, it was apparent that the Italian assault had failed. Losses were so excessive that further operations against Mount Lungo were postponed for the time being. Instead, we decided to take the town of San Pietro at the foot of the mountain. Now, our artillery pounded and repounded the enemy defenses guarding San Pietro. the 504th paratroopers were sent out to secure the hills above San Pietro. Mules carried their weapons and ammunition up the steep slopes. On 15th December, a week after their first attempt, the 143rd Regiment again moved into position for an attack on the town. German planes came over to dive bomb our positions. Smoke screens were thrown up to conceal our movements. On the narrow, heavily mined road to San Pietro, 16 tanks under direct enemy observation led the way for the infantry assault. The lead tank, three hours later, reached the edge of San Pietro. Enemy shells fired on the tank, hitting closer and closer before knocking it out. At the end of the day, only four of the 16 tanks returned. Enemy decision to abandon San Pietro came after we'd won Mount Lungo. On 17th December, our lines moved into the town. From the hills above, the 504th parachute troops descended on San Pietro. No matter how hasty their retreat, the Germans never failed to leave their mines and booby traps in the rubble of a destroyed Italian town. Few prisoners were taken in the battle for San Pietro. The German withdrawal was well executed. It was a costly battle. The 143rd Regiment alone required 1,100 replacements. Many companies lost all their officers. Enlisted men led those battered units forward. This was the scene of three weeks of the bitterest fighting on the Fifth Army front. 
For 17 days, the target for the heaviest artillery concentration of the Italian campaign. The people of San Pietro came out of the caves in which they had hidden for weeks. They found little of their belongings to salvage. Two days after the battle, General Eisenhower visited the San Pietro area for a conference with division commanders. From the hills above the town, the general could see our shells falling two miles northwest on the town of San Vittore, our next objective. In mud, rain, in cold, biting wind, our troops had driven the enemy from Mount Lungo, reaching the top by 16th December. This finally opened the way through the Mignano Gap. Troops of the 142nd on the mountain were relieved by the 15th Infantry, 3rd Division. While the battle for San Pietro was being fought, on our right flank, the 34th and 45th made diversionary attacks high in the mountains. Here, roads were direct enemy observation, our vehicles vulnerable to their guns. French troops on 10th December relieved the 34th after 73 days of combat, the first French soldiers of World War II to fight the Germans on European soil after the fall of France. With equipment completely American, French Moroccans moved forward to the 6th Corps front. On 15th December, the 6th Corps was poised for an offensive to coincide with the taking of San Pietro. Moroccan troops executed a wide envelopment of the German left Frank, while two battalions of French Gomeers prepared to advance west through high mountains to attack toward Cardito. Mountain fighting on this front was the most difficult of the campaign. In six days, the 6th Corps gained three miles, keeping pace with the 2nd Corps at San Pietro. Gumiers, accustomed to quick stabs in mountain warfare, proved a valuable arm to the 5th Army. With the approach of Christmas, the 5th Army made every attempt to provide a turkey dinner to men in foxholes all along the front. From field kitchens, the dinner, packed in marmite cans, was brought up the steep roads into the mountains. At the end of the jeep trails, mules carried the jugs farther into the heights. Higher, where terrain was too rough for mules, soldiers brought up turkey and Christmas mail by hand. Christmas Day, 1943, at the front, 45th Division Sector. Along the entire 5th Army front, the holiday of good cheer was celebrated in the cold, desolate Italian mountains. Christmas Day was not a holiday everywhere over the world in 1943. On 28th December, the bodies of 3rd Division dead, killed defending Mount Lungo, were carried down the mountain. Because of the difficult terrain, it was three days before they could be brought down for burial. There was a short period of inactivity at Mount Samucro, while the Second Corps regrouped forces and brought up fresh troops to initiate the final phase of the Winter Line campaign. On 1st January, the Second Corps saluted the new year with an artillery salvo on German defenses guarding San Vittore. Smoke rose from the stone houses and narrow streets of San Vittore. Shells fell on enemy entrenchments on Mount La Chiaia to the northwest. With control of Mignano Gap, the heights flanking Highway 6 were all that remained of the winter line. <laughs> Following the opening attack, three more attacks beat against the remaining enemy positions. Water and artillery fire burst out over the entire Second Corps front. into the last strong points of the winter line. The 168th Infantry outflanked Mount Lakiaya and struck west to capture Savaro on 12th January. At the same time, 
the 135th Infantry fought to take San Vittore. After three days on 7th January, the last of fierce street fighting ended. The town, although severely damaged, was not as hard hit as San Pietro. In the Winter Line campaign, we had taken a large toll of enemy equipment and captured over 2,000 soldiers. As San Vittore fell, the 6th Armored Infantry on the 2nd Corps left flank drove to Mount Portia, south of the important Highway 6. Three German infantry companies of the Hermann Goering Panzer Division were rushed in by the enemy to hold the mountain. Though the Germans created some confusion, our reinforced troops held on to their guns. On 7th January, with tank and artillery fire blazing behind them, our infantry reached the crest of Mount Portia. Eight days later, our 135th Infantry reached the top of Mount Trochio, the last height of the winter line. Now the 5th Army stood before Casino, guarding Highway No. 6, the road to Rome. Here, tall, cliff-faced mountains like an endless row of fortresses cut across Italy. Around this natural barrier, the Germans built a new line. The main anchor of this line was in the ring of high mountains around Casino town lay at the foot of Monastery Hill. At the top of the hill, overlooking the town, was the historic abbey, founded in the year 529. Built as a refuge for work and prayer, this impressive monument contained many medieval treasures, the Nazis removed for what they called safekeeping. The enemy denied that the abbey was being used for any military purpose whatsoever, but with the occupation of the abbey, the Germans were in full control of Casino as this captured film shows. After two costly major attacks failed, we could no longer respect the Vatican request that the monument be spared. Leaflets were fired, warning Italians to evacuate. A few days later, wave after wave of our planes came over Monastery Hill. In four hours, 500 tons of bombs were dropped to level the attic. until the bombs stopped falling and our guns were silent. Then crawled out of their holes and filtered back into the ruins of the abbey. They took up new observation and artillery positions. We had reached a grim crisis. Before us, the town, the casino, blocked our entrance to highway number six and wrong. of fighting against almost every obstruction known to warfare. A struggle too long, too bitter, to be fought to a standstill by an old Italian town in the hands of an enemy. For the 5th Army advance to continue, Casino had to be ours, even if it meant blasting the town off the face of the earth.
Its roots reach back into the worldly glory of the Roman Empire. It was then, as it is now, a minor port facing out onto the Tyrrhenian Sea. In ancient times, its name was Antium, and it was not without a degree of dubious distinction. Nero was born here, and Caligula. There is little today to recall the days of the Roman legions, and very few of the thousands of Americans who knew it during World War II would recognize its ancient name or its rebuilt, unscarred face. two decades to do their healing work. There has been peace, and much that has passed has been mercifully lost to memory. But a great many Americans will never forget this town's modern day name, the name they knew it by in 1944, Anzio. peninsula while liberating as much of Italy as might be possible with the means at our disposal. As General Clark was well aware, our objectives were one thing, the achieving of them another. In late 1943, our lack of progress in the south of Italy was leading to the necessity of a landing in the enemy's rear at Anzio. Our problems in Italy had been many. For example, there was the terrain. It was ideal for the defending enemy forces, cruelly difficult for allied troops. Oh boy, you talk about your bad country. I mean, they didn't have but two directions over there. Up the hill and down the hill. Here, methods of transport long obsolete became operational necessities. It was this kind of hostile, perpendicular country which led one Allied officer to comment, what you need to fight a war over this ground is an army of bulletproof kangaroos. The kangaroos, to be effective, would have had to be amphibious as well as bulletproof, for uncrossable rivers and blown bridges were prime facts of life. Ah, the enemy really knew his job. When those people blew a bridge, we had to start over from scratch. Some of our guys stayed wet so long, their skin puckered up like a prune. We didn't get a lot of help from the weather either, as I remember. By midwinter, the Allies' advance toward Rome had bogged down. Just south of Casino, a stalemate had developed and it was the deadlock here at the Gustav Line which germinated the seeds of the Anzio operation. Naples, mid-January 1944. The build-up for a landing at Anzio was underway. This would be an amphibious end run 
which would put a force on the beach to the enemy's rear and much too close to Rome for his comfort. Maybe we could break the casino deadlock this way. But from the start, there were serious problems. It had the looks of a very chancy operation. For one thing, when all the begging, borrowing, and scrounging were done, there were only 38 LSTs for the sea lift. What that meant was the initial landing force was going to have to be dangerously small. Two divisions. Two more to come on the second trip. Sixth Corps, that was us, under General John P. Lucas, drew the honor. It was a gamble for everybody concerned, but it had to be taken. By 21 January 1944, the task force was moving toward Anzio. The two divisions were well chosen. The British 1st Infantry had been through Dunkirk. The American 3rd had fought through Tunisia and Sicily. But at this point, all was doubt, speculation. What lay ahead, no man, at whatever level, could know for certain. By the time it got light on the 22nd, we were already putting people on the beach. I made the Salerno landing before, and I was all set in my mind for this to be just as bad. I kept waiting for them to open up with the heavy stuff. What didn't happen? I didn't get it. But I sure wasn't complaining. Unbelievably, the landing was almost completely unopposed. The enemy's reserve divisions near Rome had been drawn south by an Allied attack on the casino front designed to do just that. By an ironic bit of timing, the Germans had called off their 24-hour coast watch on the very night when the task force was approaching Anzio. Equally ironic was this. We had achieved complete surprise, and we didn't know it. The only real trouble we got that day was from the air. something like 350 planes in the whole area. We had about 2,000. So they couldn't do too much. Still, at the time, it seemed like enough. Despite harassment from the air, losses were light. The first day saw 90% of the landing forces ashore. Immediately, they began consolidating the beachhead against the enemy counterattack, expected at any moment. reserve divisions pulled south by the casino attack, the enemy had only ragtag fragments of units at his disposal, but he moved them up quickly. Prisoners taken in the first days were universally smiling and confident once they discovered they were not going to be mistreated. They were certain that in a matter of days they would see the Allied landing force pushed into the sea. The 6th Corps had already faced the swift and professional reaction of the German commander Kesselring at Salerno and expected no less of him in this new meeting. He lost no time in eliminating the advantage of surprise which the Allies had unknowingly gained. At Kesselring's command, General von Mackensen assumed responsibility for Anzio and by evening of the second day of the landing, parts of eight divisions were in position and more were moving up. Beginning at dawn, four days after the first landing, the Allied force set out to push farther inland, enlarging the beachhead. The golden moment of surprise was gone. They came against rigid opposition. It was a foretaste of things to come. In three days of fighting, the perimeter was extended somewhat, but the cost was high. A force of 767 American Rangers trying to infiltrate and capture nearby Cisterna was ambushed. Most were taken prisoner. By now, the other two divisions of the 6th Corps had arrived, but so had the enemy. 
It was one of my duties as a medical officer to keep a listing of casualties for Corps headquarters. By the end of January, we had taken a total of 3,000 casualties. As a statistic, that's a straightforward figure. The mind may accept it without distress. The thing that must be remembered is this. The statistic refers to 30 times 100 human beings hurt or killed. The Allied offensive ground to a stop, and the Anzio forces went on the defensive. Bad weather came. This meant no air cover. This meant enemy forces building up without hindrance. A counterattack was inevitable, and we got ready for it. But barbed wire and mines, so helpful to a force on the defensive, were in somewhat short supply. The enemy intended now to make another Dunkirk of Anzio. Swiftly, he shifted forces from northern Italy, southern France, and even the Balkans. Daily, his fighting machine was growing stronger on the ground, as casualties drew the Allied forces thinner. By mid-February, the enemy had pushed the Allies back in the center of the grimly held beachhead, almost to the last ditch lines of defense. The outlook, depending on which side you were looking from, was excitingly bright, or very dark. Now, once again, an Allied attempt in the south to breach the Gustav line failed. The men on the ground didn't know that the breakthrough attempt was also intended to ease the pressure on the Anzio perimeter. They only knew that enemy guns still looked down their necks from the fortified heights, and that advance became impossible. With the repulse of the second Casino offensive, it became clear. Anzio was on its own. The crisis was here. Every resource was marshaled to meet it. When the massive frontal attacks came, we met them with a hurricane of fire. Heavy and well-directed naval gunfire played an important part in holding back the enemy tide. The Anzio front was so close to the sea that naval guns became infantry support weapons. proved the saving factor. Artillery, naval shelling, and ton after ton of bombs. Limited by Hitler's personal plan to a narrow front, the enemy force was doomed to spend itself against a solid wall of explosives. Having weathered the crisis, the 6th Corps' commander, General Lucas, received a new assignment. Assistant Commander, 5th Army. The new commander of the Anzio force was General Lucian K. Truscott, recently appointed deputy to General Lucas and former commander of the 3rd Division. What lay ahead was now up to him. This was the situation the new commander faced. He held a beachhead, but a smaller one. In the center, an ugly bulge remained, and there it stayed. The simple fact was, neither side had strength to do anything about it. Now came a strange three-month period which no one who was there will forget the Static War at Anzio, or as some called it, the Sitzkrieg. By now, everybody was used to living in holes. Anyway, as used to it as you can get. When we could, we'd put in the time on improvements. We used to say we had all the comforts of home, provided you lived in a muddy hole in the ground back home. Within the reduced area of the beachhead, there was now no corner which was out of range of enemy artillery. Like industrious moles, the Anzio forces in the field moved themselves underground. We struck it lucky. A cozy bit of a cave it was, no digging necessary. It was already occupied, as you might say, but we got on fine with the former tenants because they were very quiet. I wrote them this is not to worry about me. I was spending all my spare moments in a ruddy museum. Still, it wasn't all the cooks to her. There was always work to be done.
There was work, plenty. Daily, nightly, endlessly, there was the exchange of shells of varying sizes, weights, and types, fired out from and into the battered beachhead. get a different slant before you really see a thing. Like, you know what I mean. I mean, I heard the guns going every night. Sure, but till I got on this brass salvage detail one day, it never really hit me how much of what was going on was going on. I mean, it made you wonder how there was any mountains left, much less, you know, little stuff like houses and people. I tell you, you should have seen all that brass. It was during this period that Anzio Annie became especially well-known, though not popular among the inhabitants of the beachhead. Actually, Anzio Annie was not one, but two huge German railway guns, called Robert and Leopold by the men who directed their fire into every corner of the crowded perimeter. at Anzio, wherever you were. If you were above ground, you could be reached by artillery. That's why you could find a strange pipe sticking about at the driveway of an Italian villa. A breather pipe, an air vent. And with the aid of the Corps of Engineers, our headquarters at Anzio went underground. The main corridor gave you an idea of how big this specialized foxhole was. It ran just about a quarter of a mile in a straight line. And branching off from it, all the elements of an operating headquarters. Everything needed underground. Natural caves, all were put to use and glad to get them. What with bad weather, shellings, and air raids, there was a lot to be said for underground living at Anzio. Another constant reality of the beachhead was the endless patrolling, probing, raiding. we went at night, but sometimes it'd be a daylight raid. Maybe some enemy people would sneak in and set up observation in some house. Then a raiding party would go in and take them out. It was a regular thing. You didn't get used to it, but at least you got where you understood what you were doing. If you were lucky, you came back with everybody on their feet. If there was a good part, that was it. When everybody came back standing up. There was a right funny side to it all, though. These propaganda sheets we used to get were always good for a chuckle. I don't know yet what they hope to accomplish. time went on, there were days when it seemed like it was my dad's war all over again. Trenches, no man's land and all that. Quite often in the day, things would be so quiet you could hear small distant sounds across the field. Mind you though, night time was something else again.
one night in the bay, an ammunition ship was hit. Like a great big fireworks display. But it wasn't good to think of the people who'd been on that. After our field hospital had been bombed and shelled a few times, we decided to take steps. We couldn't go entirely underground, so we did the next best thing and built strong revetments into which the tents could be put. We nurses helped where we could. It was a huge job, but it was necessary. We'd been shelled so often, we came to be called Hell's Half Acre. In fact, some line soldiers would actually hide small wounds rather than risk being sent over here. I'm not making this up. It actually happened. Strange things happened on occasion. There was the teenage German lad we found trying to get among the ships with a one-man submarine device. He seemed much too young to be out on such business. They sent some men round to where the thing was beached to bring it in. Funny looking thing. Really not much more than one torpedo to ride on and another one underneath to shoot. Ruddy propellers started up when they started to tow it. Living up there afternoon, all right. Well, there's some jolly good sprinters among them, lads. In the end, nothing happened at all. The thing simply stopped again. Sorry to present you with an anticlimax, but you know what? It happened in the middle of a time which was very much like that. As spring approached, Danzio was the scene of massive build-up for the breakout which would have to come. Despite harassing fire, the unloading of ships went on. There was a moment when there were so many supplies on the beach that this little Italian fishing port rated seventh among the great ports of the world. Now the static war at Anzio was approaching its end. Commanders were formulating the plans which would break the Anzio forces out and set them on the road to Rome. As spring came on, there were special classes in the care and use of specialized items of destruction. Rehearsal for the real thing. Near Anzio, a group of American commanders gathered to witness a demonstration. The 3rd Division Commander, General Iron Mike O'Daniel, gave a graphic description to General Clark as well he might, since it was a device of his own inventing which the officers had come to see. The old man called it a battle sled, and that was pretty accurate. All it was, you had a bunch of foxholes, only they were steel, and rigged up for towing behind a tank. That way a squad of guys could stay in their holes for cover and move up at the same time. It's pretty neat. It never caught on, but in my book, it was a good idea. In the South, the Allied strength had grown. It was now possible to mount an all-out push against the Gustav line. It came pretty early, a feeling that this time we were going to make it. Don't ask me where we got the idea, because it was still us on the low ground and them on the high. The terrain hadn't gotten any better. Their aim hadn't gotten any worse. Just the same, the feeling was there. This time, we were going to make it. After a week of heavy fighting, it was clear that the forces in the South were, in fact, breaking through the unbreakable Gustav line. The time for a coordinated breakout from Anzio was here. May 23rd, 1944, the Anzio breakout begins. The days of the Sitzkrieg at Anzio are at an end, and the days of the beachhead itself nearly so. Both sides had been planning all sorts of little surprises for each other. You had to take it slow and watch your step. 
So it started slow. But at least we were moving at last. Here was the road to Rome. By June 4th, 1944, American troops were entering Rome. over which historians could and would widely disagree in years to come. On the battered beachhead, our men had learned much. And perhaps the enemy had learned something, too. He had done his best and his worst against the Americans and British at Anzio. And it had not been enough. chiefs of staff, the campaign had two phases. In phase one, we sought to achieve certain preliminary objectives with a limited amount of troops and equipment. What were the of phase one? Most important of all was securing complete control of the Mediterranean, even after clearing the axis out of North Africa and overrunning Sicily in 38 days, our shipping was still threatened by axis air attacks from the Italian mainland. Our second objective to exploit Mussolini's overthrow by knocking Italy out of the war. Our third objective was to capture the main Nazi airfields at Foggia. Fourth, we wanted to engage the enemy at the quickest point of contact and force him to withdraw as many divisions as possible from the Russian front and the invasion front in Western Europe. Phase one of the Italian campaign began on September 3rd, 1943, when the British 8th Army at Messina and the General Montgomery pushed across the narrow straits toward Calabria on the toe of the boot. And landed there virtually unopposed. 
The towns of Bateau were swiftly occupied, and the 8th Army pressed north up the peninsula. By September 8th, we had swiftly accomplished one of our objectives when General Eisenhower announced the capitulation of Italy. The Italian fleet surrendered. And 66 Italian divisions laid down their arms. On September 9th, the 5th Army, composed of American and British troops under General Mark Clark, headed for Salerno, 28 air miles south of Naples, the furthest point which could be protected by an umbrella of fighter planes from our bases in Sicily. At 5 a.m., the first wave went in. Seized German film shows the Germans entrenched on high ground, overlooking the harbor and beaches. They had moved in the day before, determined to prevent our landing. Despite heavy enemy fire, the first wave swarmed ashore with timetable precision. But before we could consolidate our positions, the Germans intensified their attacks. slowed up our landing, then imperiled the entire beachhead operation. Despite heavy support from the combined fleets, the situation grew more critical. The Luftwaffe was thrown into the struggle in great numbers, seriously hampering the landing of additional troops and equipment. from the RAF and the 9th American Air Force reached its peak when 1,860 sorties were flown against German troop concentrations on September 14th. On that day, the German news agency announced that Salerno was another Dunkirk. Actually, the beachhead had been secured, despite heavy losses. Meanwhile, the 8th Army was pressing north. On September 16th, patrols of the 8th and 5th made contact. The 8th was a threat to the German left flank, while the 5th Army counterattacked from the beachhead. The Germans fell back fighting before the Allied assault. Tommies and doughboys drove them out of the foothills and pressed after them. German withdrawal was complete. General Clark's order of the day read, we are here to stay. Side by side with the 8th Army, the 5th Army will advance. On September 27th, the 8th captured the Foggia airfield, achieving two more of our objectives. Our Mediterranean shipping was now relatively safe from air attack, and from Foggia we could bomb southern Germany and the Balkans. As the Russian armies advanced, we could operate in close support with them, bombing rail junctions and military installations in the German rear. Budapest, Belgrade, Bucharest, Loesti, Sofia. On October 1st, three weeks and a day after the Allied landings at Salerno, the 5th entered Naples, one of the great ports of the world. The damage done by the Germans was soon repaired, and it rapidly became our main supply artery. As our troops pushed north, they passed countless thousands returning to their battle-scarred homes. This was once a farmhouse near Franco Lisi. The farmer had refused to give up his livestock to feed German engineers. He and his family were locked into the house and the charge of explosives was set off in the cellar. It was a family of five. One month after our landing, we reached the Volturno River. There, the campaign became a battle of rivers and mountains. Fought through autumn torrents.
unit sometimes clung to their rain-soaked positions for 30 days without relief. Mud and mire followed the rains as we struggled forward. Throughout the centuries, there have been hundreds of wars in Italy, but only once. As it been conquered through these mountains, winter brought snow, ice, and freezing temperatures. A topographical map shows how the mountains lie like an endless row of fortresses, each protected by its moat, a river at right angles athwart our line of march. Here, weeks were consumed forcing a single pass, crossing a single river. A hundred men often held up a thousand. Let us see on this typical situation how the Germans defended the pass and the methods we used to capture it. Beyond the demolished bridges, the Germans laid minefields and emplaced machine guns and anti-tank guns to cover the minefields and bridgeheads. Further back, they built pillboxes and concealed artillery just over the crest of the mountain. To take a position like this, we first had to lay down a tremendous artillery barrage. Behind this, our infantry had to swim the river at night, clear away through the minefield and put the machine guns and anti-tank guns out of action. Only then could pontoon bridges be put down and our artillery brought across. Then, as our guns went to work on the pillboxes and on the enemy artillery in the mountains, the infantry captured the pass by working around the enemy's flank, storming the pillboxes from side and rear, and silencing them with grenades and flamethrowers. Much of the time, the going was too steep for vehicles and muscle and mule took over. Supplies were brought through over precarious trails. In the east, the 8th Army fought its way through the Sangro Valley. Their attack on Ortona was met by determined Nazi resistance. Powered by tanks, the Germans counterattacked desperately. For 18 days, tank battles and hand-to-hand -hand infantry fighting raged through the streets. finally driven into the northwest corner of the town. Outfought, exhausted, the enemy pulled out. The eighth pressed after them. The tide of battle swept over Ortona and left it in its wake. When General Eisenhower visited the Central Front, it was three months since we had crossed the Valturno, orders to hold at all costs. Casino lies on the northern slope of the Leary Valley, through which runs the Via Casilina, Highway Number 6. The position of the valley and the mountains overlooking it from both sides would take us forward to the foot of the last mountains, barring our way to Rome. Our plan was to force the Rapido River both to the north and south of the town. While the southern force maintained pressure, the northern unit was to circle through the mountains behind it, clean the Germans out of their positions there, and storm the town from north and rear. At Hangman's Hill, this unit fought for days. Other vantage points changed hands again and again. Finally, Another force, which had crossed the Rapido from the south, fought its way into one-third of the town. There, superb enemy resistance turned the battle into a stalemate. The Gustav Line ran across the peninsula and was anchored at Casino. To break the stalemate, we tried an end run, amphibious landings at Anzio and Nettuno. The Germans were caught off guard, and for several days, American and British troops encountered only light opposition as they landed and consolidated the beachhead. It was up to the German high command to determine the importance of this new threat to their flank and rear. Marshals Rommel and Kesselring decided against falling back and brought in 13 fresh divisions from their dwindling strategic reserves. More and more, we were accomplishing our objective of diverting Nazi divisions 
from the Western and Russian front. Heavy Luftwaffe raids supported those 13 divisions as they sought to drive us into the sea. beachhead area with innumerable small infantry fights and tremendous artillery barrages. We paid a heavy price to hold the Anzio beachhead in casualties and in men captured by the enemy shown in these Nazi films. Back at Casino, the fight continued. The Germans held an obvious advantage by their occupation of the Benedictine Abbey above the town. They were asked to abandon it and refused. We had no alternative but to bomb the Abbey to save soldiers' lives. One month later, 543 Allied planes tried to blast the enemy out of the town with a load of 1,144 tons of bombs. The Germans took cover in caves and tunnels. Behind the fighting at Casino, preparations were underway for phase two of the campaign, the all-out assault. Phase one, the preliminary campaign, was drawing to an end. Reinforcements and great quantities of new equipment were brought in. Our forces were regrouped. British and Polish troops in the Leary Valley, Americans in the west along the Garigliano River, the French Expeditionary Corps in the center. By sunset, May 11th, preparations had been completed. All along the front, the German-dominated heights were under the muzzles of Allied guns. At 11 p.m., they went into action. dawn, the big push was well underway. General Alexander, commander of the Allied forces in Italy, told his troops that to them had fallen the honor of striking their first blow in the great final invasion of Fortress Germany. Between Casino and the western coast, the powerful blows launched by the British, Poles, French, and Americans shattered the Gustav line. By May 17th, only Casino remained in German hands. Behind tanks hampered by the wreckage, British, Indian, and Polish troops fought their way in. On May 18th, Casino fell, and the Gustav line had ceased to exist. Prisoners were brought in on every sector of the front. Thousands more were slain. The men who were taken alive were beaten, exhausted, hopeless. The power of our offensive was written in their dazed, haunted faces. But there were still 17 German divisions in Italy that had to be battered to pieces. The Adolf Hitler line swung back like a gate, then crumbled beneath the sledgehammer allied blows. On May 23rd, the Anzio troops broke out of their beachhead area, and two days later the two groups met at Borgo Grappa. After four months of anguished fighting, the beachhead forces had accomplished their mission, to threaten the German rear and compel them to fall back. 
The road to Rome was lined with the wreckage of Nazi legions, blasted by Allied air power as they fled before the reunited Fifth Army. Mounting fury of the Allied drive threw the Nazis back to the outskirts of Rome. Films taken by Italian anti-fascists show the evacuation of Rome, one of the greatest blows of the war to Nazi prestige. The streets were deserted, the Nazis left. After 21 years, a free Rome laughs again. Free Rome speaks again. A free Rome reads again. A free Rome assembles in the Piazza San Pietro to receive the Pope's blessing. Remembering the dead.